Hey everybody, what's going on? I'm Andy, I'm a self-taught programmer, and in this video, what I wanted to talk to you is about the five most common coding anti-patterns for self-taught developers, and I really wanna focus on people who are just starting out, who are new to this, who aren't yet in the field. So if you are watching this, you're a seasoned developer, or you're even gotten your first job, these may not apply to you, but they may, so you might wanna stick around and watch it. So I'm really excited for this video. Before we get into it, if you're wondering who I am, I'm Andy Sterkwitz, I'm a self-taught programmer, like I said, but I'm also a mentor to everyday people who are aspiring developers, people who are looking to get into the field and teach themselves this. So I focus this entire channel here on strategies for learning, uh, also ways to get your first job. So if you're interested in that content, I highly recommend subscribing below. Also make sure to hit the bell icon to get notifications anytime I put out a new video. Now before we get into the five anti-patterns here, I just wanna quickly define what an anti-pattern is for those of you who don't know what it is. You may have heard it before, but you're not really quite clear on what it is. So an anti-pattern to me is pretty much this. It's a bad programming practice, right? It's something that people do or, or developers do consistently that leads to bugs, leads to code that is hard to work with, hard to maintain, hard to extend. In other words, build on top of. And so these anti-patterns are common because as a community of software developers, we've sort of come up with and seen like so many patterns of behavior that we all sort of do that I've done that many, many developers have done and said, okay, when we do this, the outcomes are typically bad. And so we try to come up with some rules about not what to do, as well as what to do. And those are good programming practices. So an anti-pattern is a bad programming practice. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into our first anti-pattern here. The first anti-pattern that I've seen so commonly among beginners who are just getting into software development, who are self-teaching, who are building projects is ambiguous naming of variables, ambiguous naming of functions, and even of classes. And this is a huge problem because if you are creating your little app here, if you're writing code and the variables that you're writing aren't very well named, if they're not appropriately named, if you're using, uh, if you're inappropriately using abbreviations, for example, it makes the, your own comprehension of the code all very, very difficult. And I see this all the time. And look, I will tell you as you know, year five and as a software developer, naming to me has never come easy. In other words, I sometimes will spend like 10 minutes trying to name a function or a variable because to me naming is so important because later on when I come back to a piece of code, I wanna know exactly what that code's doing if it's a function or I wanna know exactly what that variable contains if it's a variable. And this is so, so important and you'll realize this as you go on because if the variables are ambiguous to you or to some future reader of your code, which is often, some, that's often the case, like sometimes I'll come and look at your code, if I see ambiguous naming, I have a very, very, very hard time trying to comprehend what's going on. A very similar thing to me, a very similar maybe metaphor would be if you're trying to read a book and the author is using really, really uh, extensive vocabulary or really advanced vocabulary, and you'd have to go and look up a dictionary every time, you know, for every five words that you read, you'd have to go and reference a dictionary to understand the words. It's sort of similar to that. I would say like when you're reading code, especially, you know, once you get past a certain point, you can sort of just read code. You don't want a lot of clutter. You don't want to be stopping and starting and stopping and starting. When variables that are not well named, there's a lot of stop, stopping and starting because you have to go and look, what variable is this? What does it store? I have to go look at where it's referenced. It's a pain in the butt. So look, I know that this is probably not, there's not a great solution to this, but really thinking through variable names and looking at a variable and naming exactly what it is, even if it's a longer name is okay. The worst thing that, like, this is a really bad sign by the way, if you are leaving comments above variable declarations, so if you say, you know, var a is equal to a string and then above that you're saying the, the, the letter a or you're saying, you know, the comment, you're spelling out what that variable holds, that tells you enough because it says, hey, look, that comment, just put it into the variable name. Whatever you're trying to describe there, put it in the variable name. Same with a function. If you've written a function and you have a comment above it describing what's going on in the function, try just naming the function better so that it describes what's going on in the function. That's really what you need to do. So really just the solution to this is just thinking longer about variable names, thinking longer about function names, and just making sure when you're reading through the code that things make sense. If they don't make sense, then you can sort of examine whether you've named variables well, whether you name functions well. The second anti-pattern that I see that is very, very common is magic strings and numbers throughout your code. So a good example of this, I'll actually throw it up here, is just like a simple piece of code. If age is greater than 21. And by the context of this 
conditional statement, you could think to yourself, well, obviously we're checking for the legal drinking age, right? Like if you're in the United States at least, right? Because the legal drinking age is 21. But you could sit here and say, well, ah, you know, it's obvious. If the age is over 21, that's a legal drinking age. But we don't necessarily know that. And that's what you would call a magic number. The same thing could be a magic string if name is equal to Andy. Like that is great, but we don't know the context of why we're necessarily comparing that to Andy. Is that the user's name? Like what are we, why are we, you know, why are we necessarily trying to get that name? So what is much better here, instead of just having a magic string or a magic number sitting there, is you want to use a well-named variable. So you could put that in what I call mayfly variable, like a variable declared just above that, or you can have named constants, right? So you can put that in a constant because Chances are good if you're using that in this conditional statement, there could be another conditional statement somewhere else in your code and you don't have to keep repeating that number 21 or that string that has Andy in it, right? So that's a really good solution. Now, magic strings and numbers are one of the most common things and I think what when you learn this initially, it can really mess you up because anytime you see a string, you're like, oh, I'm gonna put that in a constant, I'm gonna put that in a variable. That's not necessarily the case. What I would say here is you have to really look in, at the context of where it's being used and if it's being used in many, many places, then that's a good idea for a constant. Um, so just, this is one of those things you may just want to get a feel for. You may not necessarily understand it right away, but a good thing to see is other people's code. More advanced developers, you'll see them using name constants, um, well-named variables, and I think that will make a lot more sense. The third anti-pattern is one of my favorites. This is called the lava flow pattern. I'm gonna have a little bit of different take on it than I think when you get more advanced, but what I've seen with new developers uh, with the lava flow pattern is basically think of it like this, okay? So imagine you know how lava flows off of a volcano. Well, as it comes down the, the volcano, it sort of hardens in all these different places and it becomes very immovable, right? Like it becomes very hard. And as it goes down the mountain, it keeps growing and growing and growing. And when you get to be a professional developer, this makes a lot of sense because as these applications get humongous, like there's certain parts that are just like immovable. They're set in stone, you can't really touch them. But when you're for early on, you think that you're creating these small little apps, these you know single page applications or full stack applications, that there shouldn't be this problem. But for a lot of new developers, what I see is, is you start creating these apps. They're not, I'm not talking about simple ones. I'm talking about ones that have a database, a back end, a front end, maybe using a front end framework. And what happens is, is because you're sort of working on one section, moving on to the next, going to the next, and not using Git appropriately or version control appropriately, there's certain parts of your application that become just sort of warped. They are bulky, they are hard to work with. And so you as a developer don't wanna go back and touch them. Right, and you just go on to the next thing, you start working on the next thing, and that next part, maybe it's the front end, starts becoming very bloated, it gets hard to work with, you're getting it to work, but again, it's just like there's a lot of dead code in there, code that you don't even know, like it's dead, you're not using it, but you don't know that because you've already moved on to something else and you just don't wanna break anything. And so you've got this, basically this application with all these different parts that are very hard to tell what's going on, you are afraid to touch it, because if you break that, then the whole system may break. And that, by the way, can bleed into spaghetti code. Spaghetti code is sort of describes a, a code pattern that's, the code is all over the place. There's not good, it's not very cleanly separated. It's not modularized. But the lava flow code is one where like, the different sections of the code kind of get stuck and you as a developer don't want to fix it. Now the best way to fix this is to use Git and version control correctly. So Git will save the state of your project at any point. And what Git, what's so beautiful about Git is you can use branching in Git. So in other words, You've got your master branch in Git, right? Like that's a branch that's sort of like the, the source of truth in your repository, meaning that, that that's the one thing that you don't wanna break, right? That's the code that should be working at all times. It shouldn't have any issues with it. Well, if you wanna go and build another feature in your app, or you wanna build another section of your application, that's when you will create a branch. So a branch is basically isolating your work so that your, your master branch doesn't get tainted. And you do all the work you want on there. And once you've figured out the, the best solution possible, there's no dead code, no zombie code, you can then push your changes in and everything is clean and your master branch is unharmed. But when you're not using version control like that, when you're not branching and then merging changes in when they're, the timing is appropriate, that's when you have a lot of chances for all these just like hardened parts of your code that you're like so afraid to touch. And I've been there, I get it, I get it, but like do your best not to because nothing is worse than being scared to touch your code. By the way, testing can come into this, so later on as you get to be a developer, you should definitely learn testing. Even as a beginner, I think you should learn testing, but if you haven't learned testing at this point, at least, at the very least, use Git branching, it can help out a lot.
The fourth anti-pattern that I see that's very common amongst beginners, people who are self-taught, is cut and paste, right? So cut and paste means that you're basically, it's basically this, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're cutting and pasting code. The big fear everyone has is like cutting and pasting code from Stack Overflow. And certainly I think that that can have many, many problems with it. But what I see, uh, what cut and paste means, especially in the context that I'm referring to most beginners, is that you'll see a lot of code. Like let's say you've got a calculator application, that's one that I, I see that's very, very common. And there's a lot of code that's written in, say, your JavaScript that's just like, you could tell that it's just copy and paste, right? In other words, there's 10 different functions that all do the same thing, essentially. Maybe there's one slight modification to it. And that's, that's a copy and paste, meaning that, like, look, if there were some core logic in your calculator app that were to change, you now have 10 places of liability that all have to change. You have to update each function and make sure that each function has been updated. And that's a liability. You have to go, it's like, you have to go through each one and make sure that they're the same. If you see that, if you see things that are repeated like that, that's a really, really, really good opportunity to make one function that does everything, or you can use one class, right? So in other words, copy and paste is not necessarily that you copy and paste it, but it's a code base that has repeated logic all over the place that might as well have been copy and pasted. And again, that's a liability because if anything changes, if you change code in one spot, you then have to know that there's code in other other code in, in places that you also have to change. And believe me, you think that you would remember these things, but as code bases progress, as you as your memory fades, right? Because maybe my memory is not very great, you're gonna forget about these things. So the best thing to do is when you see code repeated, refactor that into modules, classes, functions that can be shared. And that way, when you make one change to the source, module, class, or function, then all those changes propagate out. There's no liabilities. All right, and the last, the fifth, anti-pattern here is the poltergeist anti-pattern. And this is an interesting one. This is probably the, the hardest one I'm gonna have to explain here. And poltergeist has a certain meaning, I think, for, again, medium level or intermediate developers to advanced developers. But I think what I've seen in newbie developers, people who are just starting out, people who are maybe, maybe even just got their first job, is the idea of the poltergeist. And that is basically, the idea is that, you know, a poltergeist is like what, a, it's a go, it's somebody who's dead who's come back alive or something like that in the ghost form. And the anti-pattern basically is similar to that in saying that it's sort of code that is dead or like not very active that comes alive and then goes away really quickly. And I think that's not a great explanation. What I see it in and for a lot of again, newbie developers is code that doesn't really serve a true purpose. In other words, it seems as almost the, the person created a new class or a new function or even, I mean, potentially like a module or something like that, that just doesn't really, it's not a meaningful abstraction, right? In other words, it's sort of like, it's just adding another class that doesn't really do anything on its own. It sort of calls other classes or other methods or other functions. A lot of times developers want to get really cute about things, right? Like we want to create more code, more classes. We want a bigger directory structure in our application because we feel like we're developers, like, oh, I'm developing. But to be honest with you, it's more important to have concise projects, meaning like your project structure isn't all over the place, have meaningful like naming and organization and structure. Same thing with your code. You don't wanna have a lot of code. You don't wanna be creating functions, modules, classes, just for the sake of it. You wanna have very, very strict uh, guidelines about when it's appropriate to create a new class and that sort of thing. So again, like this is one of the hardest things to describe. I think it really comes down to getting experience under your belt, looking at other projects that people have built who know what they're doing and getting a sense for when it's appropriate to create a new class and that sort of thing. I think having somebody you know who can look over things, if you if you know any developers, is a really big advantage and they can help you with this sort of thing because it's very, very obvious to somebody who's been doing this for some time when you're just sort of creating classes and methods and functions and that sort of thing on the fly and you don't really need it and when they're not meaningful abstractions. So I hope this video helped guys. These are my five anti-patterns for beginners, for self-taught developers. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, leave a comment if you uh, partake in any of these bad patterns or if you have any that you wanna share yourself. And by the way guys, if you are looking to become a self-taught developer, if you're looking to get into the field and you are struggling and you want guidance and help, I do have a mentorship program. It's an awesome program. It's by invitation only. It's about really getting that structure and guidance to get you moving forward to land that first job in the field. So if you are interested in that, what I highly recommend doing is booking a free career strategy session with me 
uh, during that call, it's a really, really important call. I would break down some of the issues that you're having, really cover what you're struggling with. From there, I wanna figure out what your goals are, what you're trying to do in this. And then at the very end, if the mentorship is a good fit from there, I can break down what it would look like for you. So I highly recommend booking a call. I will leave a link in the description below. You can also go to andysterkowitz.com forward slash call. Um, other than that, that's really all I've got for today. So thank you so much for watching. And as always guys, peace out.